No hallowed skein of stars can ward I tro, who's once been set his tryst with Tristero. Welcome to Ruby Reviews Books. Reviews from a cat who cannot read. From a cat who cannot read. Ruby Reviews Books. Where Ruby, a cat who cannot read. Welcome to Ruby Reviews Books. Reviews from a cat who cannot read. She may not understand the words, but she sure likes books. Today's book is The Crying of Lot 49 by Thomas Pynchon. Set in 1960s California, this book details the maybes of a vast postal conspiracy as it envelops a young housewife appointed against her will as executrix of her dead lover's estate. Oedipa Mass, drawn from her Northern California home to the fictional town of San Narciso, stumbles upon cryptic iconography of a muted postal horn that, once seen, becomes a sort of Bader-Meinhof phenomenon, leading her down a rabbit hole of a three-century-long feud between the rightful heirs of a Holy Roman postal monopoly. In typical Pynchon fashion, this conspiracy might have some heft to it, or it might be the paranoid imaginings of a woman out of her depth and deep in the weeds in settling in a state that she knows nothing about. Through a series of obscure subjects, Pynchon draws us deep into the mystery without ever seeming to spoil it. It seems as if each revelation unravels itself along the way. For instance, a collection of irregular stamps might suggest a parallel structure of potsage, or it could merely be a curation of misprints. This is the kind of storytelling that makes Pynchon impressive, to take philately and turn it into a compelling enigma, even if we're not sure if that subject actually sheds light on the story or casts us further into shadow. And like many of Pynchon's novels, parsing plot from meaning becomes hard, as the book basically works to evade any clear meaning in what Oedipa experiences. Do the links between a disgruntled engineer a society of forsworn lovers and a drunken sailor amount to a hitherto unknown world intruding upon Oedipus like a miraculous revelation that confirms a sordid counterculture usurping the USPS? Or is it like Nephastus' perpetual motion machine by Maxwell's demon, a sort of psychic fiction that works only when attuned to the mind of a true believer? Or could it be something else altogether, a sort of paranoid banality that bends its coincidences so far on itself that it creates a conspiratorial Munchausen by proxy. Not unlike the Peter Pingwood Society, a collection of anarcho-capitalists so libertarian and anti-communist that they have taken the message of their former Confederate founder to such extremes that they exactly resemble the leftist anti-corporatism they most adamantly oppose. The Crying of Lot 49 offers no answers here, peeling back layers of questions to something more essential and elusive, forcing Oedipa to confront the four equally immense ideas that threaten to overwhelm her. Either it's a bona fide conspiracy, a paranoid hallucination, an elaborate prank, or her delusion of such a coordinated plot against her transforming everyone around her into some degree of co-conspirator. None of these choices appeal to Oedipa, who finds herself alternately edged out and egged on by possibility. But no choice can be a choice unto itself, while every man around her seems to peel off into some bland, predictable degeneracy, we're left with the words of her ex-Nazi psychotherapist. Hold on to your fantasies, for when you lose them, you begin to cease to be. Like Oedipa, we cling to the threat of something that might be there. Though the author himself has disparaged this book, when I read it, I see The Crying of Lot 49 as a bit of the proto pynchon novel. We are beautifully assaulted with the world's most insane character names. Mike Fallopian, Manny Depresso, Mucho Mas, Dr. Hilarious, Bloody Chicklets, and Genghis Cohen, to name a few. As a protagonist, Oedipa prefigures some of Pynchon's later detectives, though maybe with less agency than Doc Sportello or Maxine Tarnow. We also dip into the shallow end of corporate political defense interests that intersect to stymie 
protagonists, where Yo-Yo Dine co-opting the patents of its employees might be a precursor to the light bulb monopolies and golden fang to come. We also see depictions of California Republicans, neo-Nazis, and even a reference to the moon having been ripped out from the Pacific that seems to be a template for the Lemuria passage in Inherent Vice. When it comes to obscure words and overwhelming rapid-fire cultural references, it's incredible what can be crammed into a 150-page book, making this one of the densest short novels I have ever read. It's probably my third or fourth time picking it up, and there's still new stuff that I missed in prior readings. Those references come together in a way that not only gives The Crying of Lot 49 an intertextuality with other works, whether it be Nabokov or The Beatles, but it seems part of a far larger canon that, as a reader, um, I can only feel that I have scratched the surface of. While not Pynchon's best work in the strictest sense, there's a special place in my heart for this book. Each time I read it, I feel like Oedipa, as if I've walked into the sanctum of a world that I only begin to understand, and that, with arms flung wide, something either monstrous or wonderful is about to be revealed. I give it five stars out of five. Let's see what Ruby thinks. One, two, three... Oh, lick for another lick five. Well, there you have it. The Crying of Lot 49 by Thomas Pynchon, rated five stars, five rubs, and two licks of the chops. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. If you have any suggestions on what we should read next, please leave a comment.